All right, you guys, if you want to find Matthew chapter 5, we continue our verse at a time march through the Beatitudes. I want you guys to know this is the longest I've gone in doing one verse a week. Uh, It's a challenge for me at times, but most of the time um, it's more of a challenge for me to not be long-winded, as strange as that sounds. Um, because there's so much that you can really go into and talk about when you take these focused looks, what we would call a deep dive into something like this. It's important to recognize that um, Jesus really is expounding on Old Testament teaching in a whole new way. Uh, He's showing that he is the fulfillment of the law, but there's so much to it. And so as we look at this text and as we go to Matthew 5 this morning, before we read our beatitude for today, I want to begin by reading Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8, because I believe this text really sets up where we're going in Matthew 5 this morning. And Micah 6, verses 6 through 8 says this. I'm reading from the New Living. That's what's on the screen behind you as well. What can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Do what's right, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. It sounds so simplistic when you say it, but the second we walk out that door, uh, in fact, the second we start interacting with each other in this room is really where it begins, isn't it? Because, you know, the hardest people to love are your family, and I hope that this is a church family. But the most difficult people, as we're going to talk about later, to show mercy to are the people closest to us. And as we think about this, you guys, let's be really clear. To do what's right, is that based upon your personal opinion? Is it doing what's right according to your opinion? And I hope that we're like, no, resoundingly no, because that's what the world is telling us. Right? The world tells you, do what's right in your own eyes. Do what's right to you. You do you, and you define what right and wrong is. And if that's actually true, then chaos is the only thing that will reign in this world. And we know that that's not how God has done things. He has written on our hearts. We understand the difference between right and wrong. And so God is who defines what right is. And I know we know these things. I'm just, it's a setup. I'm just going to tell you ahead of time. This is a trap. I'm setting you up, okay? It's a trap. Okay. We're to do what God says is right. Now, we are to walk in that place, in walking in his rightness. You would call it God's righteousness. We are then to walk humbly with him. And that makes sense because we define what is right. I humble myself to what he has said is right, and I walk with him in his righteousness. It makes sense. The two just connect with each other. Both are common characteristics of a follower of Jesus, by the way. If you look at Scripture, if you follow Scripture, if you submit to Scripture, and I think they've been discussed a lot. Walking in humility with God, I've heard taught a lot. You know, being righteous or walking in God rightness, having a proper view scripturally of what right and wrong is, I've heard that taught a lot as well. How many sermons have you heard? I'm curious, because I haven't heard any on loving mercy. Loving mercy. Think about that. Do we love mercy? Is that something that defines us? Because if if we see that it's important that we do what's right in the eyes of God, that we do what is right, and that we walk humbly with God, in the same breath, Micah writes, we should love mercy. This is something that the Lord requires of us, it says. If we love God, then we love mercy, and not only love the mercy he gives us every minute of our lives. Oh, I love that kind of mercy, don't you? I love it when God's compassionate towards me. I love it when God shows his favor towards me. I'm all about that. Do you realize that loving mercy is not just when God shows us mercy, it's that we love it enough to give to others. That we love mercy so much that we give it to others because we recognize that the vertical outpouring of God upon us creates a horizontal response if it's in truth. We immediately should respond in mercy to others. Now, this is where this gets really tricky. I don't like showing mercy. You're like, oh, terrible thing for a pastor to say. I know. It's why I struggle with the Beatitudes. It's why God is working me over when I read this stuff. 
Every minute of our lives, God is pouring out his mercy on us. And this mercy comes to define us as believers, not only in our relationship with him, but how we treat others. How we show that mercy also defines us. The latter part of my statement, that God pours out his mercy upon us, but our mercy to others defines us, cannot be absent from our lives. It cannot be absent, and I'm going to show you as we go through this text why the first four Beatitudes lead us up to this point. Because we're beginning the section of the Beatitudes that are people word, if you will. In other words, the first four are, are pr primarily focused on our relationship with God. Poverty of spirit is some, a recognition of who God is. Mournful of my sin or grieving sin, that's also something that's between God and I. We start talking about humility or meekness. Blessed are the meek. That's something I take a position or a humility in God's eyes. And that affects others, but it's primarily a relationship between God and I. And then I hunger and I thirst for his righteousness. But now we get to mercy. And blessed are the merciful. Do I show God mercy? No. Why would I show God mercy? He's perfect. He is holy. God's mercy, mercy is Murphy, <laughs> Murphy's law. God's mercy is one directional. It comes to me, right? I don't show God mercy. He is perfect. You know, like, well, I'll cut God a break this week. <laughs> you terribly misunderstand God. Like, we all, we all understand that. Do I show God grace? No. Does he show me grace? Also one directional. So when he says, blessed are the merciful, we are talking about a relationship that is going people word. We're talking about relationships with one another. And so it's important for us to frame that into our mind before we go into Matthew 5, 7, because Jesus continues to take us deeper. Jesus is going deep. And we talked about this at the onset of, of the Sermon on the Mount. There is so much about the Sermon on the Mount that people want to disqualify as not practical or achievable. And if you're looking at it in the eyes of your flesh, then you're right. You're absolutely right. But I can't help but think of what Paul says in Romans 8 when he says, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. He says, you aren't under condemnation of sin any longer. Sin has no hold over us anymore in Jesus. So we are empowered by the Spirit to live this way because Jesus gave us the Spirit as a seal of redemption when he saved us from our sin. Amen? So we are empowered by the Spirit to live this way. Don't write this off. Don't set it aside and say, this is for someone else. Boy, Mike has a lot of problems. He needs to work them out. You're absolutely right. But in the same breath, this is a community thing that we have to face together and individually. Are we merciful individually? Are we merciful as a ministry, as a church, as a community of believers? Are we people who are defined by mercy? Okay, let's look at the one beatitude. It's so easy to tell you guys to look at the text. You're going to read like a few words. Matthew 5, 7 says this, Jesus continues the Beatitudes, which is better than a bad attitude. And he says in verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Easy one to memorize. I would recommend it. Important to distinguish as we think about mercy and as we think about Jesus teaching about mercy. Mercy and grace are different things. However, oftentimes we interchange them. I think a lot of times we think about them in the same breath. In other words, if God has shown mercy to us, isn't that him showing grace to me? So we need to frame these up a little bit because we need to understand the difference. The noun Elios mercy always deals with what we see of pain, misery, and distress. Elios, when you see mercy is used, it's how we're responding to pain, to misery and distress, the results, if you will, of sin. Mercy is dealing with results of sin. Okay, so we can think of it as in a channel in that direction. Grace or charis, which you may be familiar with, always deals with the sin and guilt itself. So when we're talking about God's grace, it's dealing with the sin directly or is being given to that specific sin. Mercy is being shown for the results of that sin. And the reason it's important to distinguish is because whereas mercy extends relief, grace extends pardon. Does that make sense? Mercy extends relief. Grace extends pardon. While mercy cures, heals, and helps, grace cleanses and reinstates. So it's important to see the different properties because when we're talking about mercy, we're talking about compassion in a lot of this. 
We're talking about caring for people who are suffering because of sin. We'll get into a little bit more later how difficult it is for us to not see sin as deserved, especially in people's lives that we're close to. I am terribly merciful towards myself when I'm suffering for the results of sin. But when I look at other people, think about it. Don't you dare raise your hands. We're going to be in that place of, you know, well, so-and-so, finally this happened, be like, well, they had that coming. Right? So often that's what we think of people. Oh, they had that coming. Well, you want to know why. And here comes the slander, and here comes the gossip, and here comes the lack of mercy. That's not the Lord. The blessed or happy ones are the merciful. It speaks of our mercifulness outward or people word. Sometimes general statements can be frustrating. Do you ever get frustrated with general statements in scripture? I do. Blessed are the merciful. To who? He doesn't say. Do you want to know why? Everyone. If I don't know who he's implying this to, he says, blessed are the merciful, and Jesus leaves it there, that means that if I want to be on the safe side of things, actually, if I just want to be on the biblical side of things, which is also the safe side, they're congruent, I have to show mercy to everyone. Dang it. Think about that. When you're driving on the road and you get cut off in traffic, blessed are the merciful. When somebody rams you in your calf with their their cart at Costco, blessed are the merciful. You're like, I thought that was a forgiveness thing. You are to show them compassion, not just be like, I forgive you. Mm." Like so many times, that's how we see forgiveness. Well, I'm forgiving you, but I'm still struggling. Are you showing them compassion because of what sin is doing to them? Are you showing compassion because of the situation they're in? That's mercy. That's care. That's showing the love of God. General statements can be difficult because we don't want to apply it to certain people. We don't want it to count for everyone. Everyone but that one. Can I hate that one? Can I not like that one? Who am I supposed to be merciful to? People in distress? Yes. The poor and the hungry? Yes. How about those who wrong me? Yes. All of them. Although I reserve the right to be merciful to their face and slander them when they're not around. I'll, seriously, though, some people are smirking. Some are just staring at me right now. You're revealing yourself. Everyone smirk. Here's the thing. We struggle with this in more ways than we want to admit. We struggle with this in so many ways because we think that it only applies to what they see, not a condition of the heart. Mercy begins in here. And if it's just here and it's not flowing from here, we're inauthentic, we're hypocrites. We're not really merciful, we're just putting on a good Christian show. And we don't want to put on a good Christian show, that's pharisaical. That's what the Pharisees did. Whitewashed tombs, Jesus called them. Church, I fear that so many times we recognize that in the Pharisees, but we don't recognize it in ourselves. We don't recognize that I can be a whitewashed tomb. Because I'm so frustrated with, you know, I come before you today exasperated, completely exasperated with someone in my life. I'm being specific. I'm not saying this is like an array. There are some people. No, there is a person in my life I am exasperated with, and I'm having a very hard time showing mercy to. Why? Because I'm justified in that? No. There is no justification for me not showing this person mercy. Because the second that I think I'm better than them, I forget the grace of God. I forget the salvation of God. I forget that he saved me from my darkest time. And if I don't show mercy to him, then I'm not going to receive mercy. And that's not the motivation. That's the heartbreaking reality. Because if we let God transform us, then we will be shown mercy as well as giving that out. But that's not the motivation for doing it. I'll talk about that in a minute. But you guys, I'm just being real with you. I would be foolish to think that I can stand blameless before God when I utterly despise, mistreat, and condemn people who are created in his image. 
I cannot stand before God blameless if that's what's going on inside of my heart and something that he has empowered me to be free from. He has given us the ability to be free from that. He has given us the ability to be conduits of mercy rather than wells filled with bitterness. Sky Jathani said it really well. He said, those who are comfortable praising God while showing contempt for people look more like the Pharisees who killed Jesus than the disciples who followed him. It's exhausting reading truth. That's really hard to take. That's hard to swallow. If I'm comfortable praising God while showing contempt for people, I'm a Pharisee. I'm not a disciple. I mean, people are like, that's offensive. Yeah, it is, because it's true. It's offending us because it's true, and, and it hits us in the heart. There's not one person you've seen or met that I have seen or met that has not been a continuous recipient of God's mercy, and that includes us. We have been given grace and mercy through Jesus Christ. God's hand has extended to men. He has reconciled all men to himself, it says in 2 Corinthians 5. It's up to people to say, I will receive that free gift. I receive that. I, want, I need that. But you guys recognize that there's not one person that we've come across that has not been a recipient of the mercy of God. And as his children, co-heirs with Christ. By the way, that takes it up a huge notch. That's what Paul says in Romans 8 as well. We are co-heirs with Christ. As co-heirs in Jesus, we reflect him when we show mercy to others, even those who we don't want to show it to or who we think don't deserve it even if people don't deserve it. Did we deserve it? It didn't stop him, did it? Aren't we supposed to be conformed into the image of his son? Then we too should show mercy when people don't deserve it. This is hard-hitting stuff. It's a lot harder than just reading verse 7 and moving on to verse 8, isn't it? It is for me. When we don't show mercy to one another, we're revealing a break in relationship. And before you think about man word, it's God word. When we don't show mercy to others, we show that there's a break in our relationship with God. Is that on him? No, no. And in fact, John says this in First John, I'm ad living. I'm ad living here, people. I know, I know, here we go. Christian's like, I gotta throw out one of the songs at the end. Hold on, Mike's ad living. First John chapter one, verse six says this. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we're lying and not practicing the truth. You cannot walk in darkness and say you have fellowship with God. You're like, did I just become unsaved? No, he said fellowship. You're not in fellowship with God. And what does he say to follow that up? If we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Hold up. Did you notice that? If I'm walking in the light, I'm in fellowship with God. He's not dealing with that. He says we have fellowship with one another when we walk in the light. Our vertical relationship with God fixes our horizontal relationships with men and women. Does that make sense? You guys, this is what he's getting across here. This mercifulness towards people, if I don't have it, something's broken here. Something's broken between God and I, and it's not on him. I have broken in fellowship with him. I need to come back, John chapter 13, let him wash my feet again and be restored back to him. I need to be cleansed of my sin as John goes on in 1 John 1, 9 and says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Go to God and confess so that mercy will flow out of you like a torrent of living water. Back in Matthew. Something that we have to recognize when we see the antithesis of a point is the unmercifulness of the world the unmercifulness of the world. When you're focused on self, you can't be merciful towards others. When you're selfish, the very definition of selfish is only caring about self, which means you are not going to be merciful towards others. You're going to take what you can get from them and not look to be a blessing to them. And the world is unmerciful, and as worldliness seeps into the church, so too the church can become this way, valuing revenge over forgiveness and insulation rather than active mercy. Did you notice I mentioned insulation? It's because we got different personality types. I'll explain that. 
Let's talk about the revenge attitude. The world would be a very different place if people didn't cheer on superheroes like John Wick. Why do I point that out? Because the whole thing's about revenge. Getting back at people. All the guys are like, mm, John Wick, yeah, woo, woo, right? Think about it for a second. That movie is all about vengeance. It's all about revenge. Christian, let it not be so of us. Looking like Jesus is very different than looking like the heroes of the world. Like the superheroes of the world. I call him a superhero because no one could do what John Wick does. But you guys, and some of you are like, John Wick who? Don't go look it up. Just trust me. Like, it's, it's not who you want to be. It's not who you want to be, right? It's just someone who's out for revenge. Oh, okay, shit, what they killed his dog. Oh, that's right. Blessed are the merciful unless they kill the dog. Then all rules are off. Okay, you're right. It's, all bets are off at that point. But it's funny, though, because that's a great point. Mike's joking, but like, maybe. But the thing is, is you, now think about this. How often is that our justification, though? What a, what a great opportunity for a teaching moment. I used to take those in my class all the time. Someone throws a little thing out there like, ah, a teaching moment. You guys, that's how we justify being unmerciful. But they did this. But they did that. You don't understand how I was treated. Immediately, they did this to the dog. And that affected you in some way. Or they did this to your kid and this affected you in some way. So therefore, I'm justified in not showing them the mercy of God that was given to me freely through Christ Jesus. I am not a reflection of him anymore. I'm a reflection of my stinky, rotten, gross flesh. That's the truth. I'm just running around with my filthy rags, slapping people in the faces with them. That's true. That's what it is. That's not how we learned Christ. So some of us will look at the world and we'll follow that pathway, us A-type personalities. A lot of times, that's me. Revenge. I'll get back at you. Don't you dare. That's not merciful. Now think about this. This is another one that lies more veiled. Some of us, when we feel that God is calling us to show mercy to people we've been hurt by and we don't want to do that, we choose insulation. What's that? 40 acres, tall fence, nobody near me. You're like, all of the introverts are like, Bzz. oh, sorry, you guys were already looking down. You're looking over here now. But hold on. You guys understand this, though. The, the people who have that personality will say, see, to avoid just being hurt by people, I'm going to withdraw also sin because Jesus was the most vulnerable man who ever walked this planet. And because people were hurting him, he never ran. Rather, he pressed forward to the cross, laying his life down. We cannot insulate, and we cannot be out for revenge. We need to do exactly what Jesus did and be on the mission that God put us here to do. God has sent me here for a purpose. The Father has asked me to do this, and I will do it. As one great theologian once said, once decided to follow the will of the Father, he drank the cup to the dregs. He drank every last drop of that wrath because that was the mission that God sent him for. Are you willing to drink to the dregs the pain of this life so that you can be a light of mercy to others? Because that's exactly what God has empowered us to do by his spirit. Every single one of us, he's empowered us to live this way. We're to put our hearts in a place of exposure because we're called to care and show compassion, and you can't do that from sending good thoughts on Facebook. It is not a replacement for caring for people. Do you ever get that little notification on Facebook for those of you that use it? You use Facebook and it says, today is so-and-so's birthday. Send them good thoughts. I'm like, good thoughts? What? And, and immediately I'm like, there's no good thought. No, not one. No, but like I, I, I immediately go to a different place and start like breaking this down. You're like, what does it mean a good thought? Like, you know, it's sunny outside, or I like pizza. That's a good thought. I mean, like, what, what do you mean send them good thoughts? What it's saying is encourage them. But is it really that encouraging to, like, send somebody something and be like, I like Reese's? Best thought I had, right? No, what it's saying is we need to encourage them, but you realize that that's not enough. It's not enough for us to just send good thoughts to people and expect that to be compassion. We have to show compassion. Think about it. James talks about this in James 2. Verse 15, if a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, stay warm, and be well fed, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? 
Don't send people good thoughts. Do something. In the same way, and we know this verse, but it's great that the setup for it was a practical application of taking care of people's needs. We know what comes next because we hear this read all the time. In the same way, faith, if it does not have works, is dead by itself. For someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith by my works. Are those works going to save him? No. What are they? Evidence. Evidence of what he believes. Evidence of what God has done within. That faith is proven by what he does, by how he lives. Well, how he lives is not saving him, but it's evidence of what's going on inside. It is not enough to tell somebody, be warm and fed. You must get them warm and feed them. That's what showing mercy is. That is the essence of mercy. And those who are merciful will be shown mercy. And just to clarify, that's not our motivation. You know, well, I need some mercy. Here's a blanket. Right? Think about this. We aren't doing this to get something out of it. The motivation is not getting something. This is not a situation that we do the right thing in order to get a piece of spiritual candy at the end. Right? That's not our motivation. The same applies for what Jesus will go on to say in Matthew 6, 14 through 15. For if you forgive, forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offenses. Be like, well, I want him to forgive my friends. I guess I better do what he told me to. That's not the motivation. He's just speaking reality. He's just telling you what reality is. However, that is not the motivation of what you do. We don't merit mercy by mercy or forgiveness by forgiveness. You cannot receive the mercy and forgiveness of God unless we repent. Unless we repent of our sin. And we cannot claim to have repented of our sins if we're unmerciful towards the sins of others. I can't look at you and go, I'm so broken over my sin. But their sin, that's, that's not how it works. Nothing moves me to forgive like the overwhelming revelation that I myself have been forgiven. And we must be reminded of this constantly. Nothing motivates me or drives me to show mercy than receiving the mercy of God in my own life. And receiving God's mercy is not a one-time event, right? Receiving the mercy and the grace of God is happening all the time. Why? Because I live in this gross fleshly body that's decaying. And I live in a world that is reeking of sin. And so mercy and the mercy of God is needed all the time. Indeed, as Jeremiah writes in Lamentations 3, and 23, because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish for his mercies never end. His mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. We sang it in the song this morning. Great is your faithfulness. His mercies never end. And in the same way, Jesus calls us to not only receive the mercy of God fresh every morning, but to offer it as well. My mercy for others should renew every morning. Do we think about loving mercy from Micah 6, 8? And blessed are the merciful in that context that when the mercies of God renew every morning for us, ours should renew for our fellow people. My mercy should renew in the morning for these people. And boy, do we need it. Parents, can I get an amen? Right? Because I need mercy for my kids every morning. Why? Because something will be broken. Something will be spilled. Someone will be offended. Someone's falling down the stairs. And it's someone else's fault. Like, something's going to happen. Five kids in the house, calamity happens. I need God's mercy every morning, and they need my mercy every morning. And I need theirs. Do you ever think about that? We need the mercy of our family as well. If we teach our children to be merciful, you realize that we need them to show us mercy as well. Why? Because contrary to your parental poll that you took by yourself with a vote of one, you're not always right. And you're not always going to do it right or be perfect. There is no perfect grandparent, although they pretend like they are. There is no perfect parent, although they know they're not. They're just lying. But here, here's the thing. Like, we, we need the mercy of our, of our children as well. Parents, can I give you just a tiny little encouragement? Ask your kids for forgiveness when you do something wrong. 
You want to know why? Because it's right and because they're going to they're learn from you. They're going to learn from you that if you value forgiveness and if you value brokenness and being humble, they will follow suit. They're just doing what you're doing. We have to be transformed by the mercy of God in the same way that we're transformed by his forgiveness. And there's some questions we need to ask ourselves at this point. And I just want to put these out there for you to consider. How has the mercy of God transformed me? Spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and physically. How has the mercy of God transformed me? Am I merciful to the wretched? Whatever that wretched is. Am I merciful and tender-hearted towards the broken. Am I helpful and compassionate toward the backslidden or the fallen? Too easy? Am I merciful to those who make my life most difficult? Am I merciful to those who make my life most difficult? I am reading a book called Faithful Leaders by Rico Tice. I just finished it yesterday. And and it's one of those books that you just set down and go, Pfft, because he's not pretending to have all this down. I just hate that he's calling out my flaws on every single page. And and there's grace. It's not like, you know, you're trash, Pastor. It's like, no, I, I just, <laughs> my wife says that. But I, I feel like, that, I'm kidding, not all the time. I feel like there's there's this... <laughs> There's this, um, this weight sometimes to reading this, this brutal honesty from other pastors, this brutal honesty about how difficult it is to be in leadership. And he said basically this, he's like, pastor, do you think you're loving? How well do you love the person who makes your life the toughest? How well do you love that one person that makes your ministry or your life miserable? Oh, not well, terribly. Is there a human blender out there? I mean, like, I, I, there's all these thoughts for people, like, I just want, I can't handle it. It's overwhelming to me. Some of you are so much more gracious than I am. So you're like, well, you know, this person did this to me, and you just got to love them. I'm like, do you mean that? <laughs> like, like, could you please show your heart to me? I want to know if you mean that, because if you do, we need to spend a lot of time together. <laughs> and that's actually really good advice. We should spend time with people who can teach us more. In that way, God gives us each other in community so we can learn from each other's humility, so we can learn from each other's mistakes, so that we can build one another up, bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2. That's why we have each other. Are we perfect? <laughs> but we have Jesus. And we can encourage each other with that. It's incredible to me as we close this out how ap the application of the first four Beatitudes comes into play here in the fifth as we look at blessed are the merciful. As we begin our people word Beatitudes, if you will, for the continuation of this section of the Sermon on the Mount. When we recognize our poverty in spirit and when we grieve over our sin, when we're humbled by his love for us and thirsting for his righteousness, mercy really is the next logical outpouring when you put all those things in conjunction with each other. Mercy is the next natural thing. To be meek is to acknowledge to others that we're sinners. To be merciful is to have compassion on others because they're sinners too. I'll say that again. To be meek is to acknowledge to others that we're sinners. I'm recognizing it. To be merciful is to have compassion on others because they're sinners too. Let us not forget that. Let us give no room to sin. Let us fight our sin. Let us battle against it. Let us be brutal with it, as Paul calls us to. But let us always remember that God calls us to be compassionate to those who are in the same fight, who are in the same struggle. And what a ministry this would be if we just obey what Jesus teaches us here in the Beatitudes. If we could take these 10 verses and if we would just apply them to our ministry in every aspect. I mean, there's so much more. You're like, really, just this? Just those? No, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. If we just, basically what I'm saying is if we just live what Jesus said, this church would be 
as effective as he desires it to be, as glorifying to his name as he has called us to be. And I hope that that's the road that we're going down. Sanctification is not easy. It's like putting gold into a furnace. You're like, that doesn't sound very nice. No, but it's the only thing that brings the dross out. It's the only thing that draws impurity out is fire. And he is proving us by fire. He's refining us. He's sanctifying us. Church, the best part is, according to Philippians 1, 6, we come out on the other side, gold. Because of the day of Christ Jesus, he will complete the work that he has began in us. And so let's entrust him for that. Church, let's show mercy to each other. But not because we have to, because he has shown mercy to us. Father, as we contemplate, as we consider what these verses mean in our personal lives, Lord, you, you didn't have a selection of meaning. This has one meaning, but many applications. You meant one thing when you said this, but it applies to our lives in so many dynamics and addresses so many things that we're going through right now. Lord, I can think of of decades of struggle in some areas of showing mercy, and I can think of something as recent as this week that I'm struggling with. And Lord, it's not, it's not sin that I am enslaved to. So Lord, would you cleanse us again? As we just take a moment and as we pray and as we seek your face and as we sing your praises, Lord, I ask that in this moment right now that you would make us aware individually of the sin, whether that's a sin of being unmerciful, Lord, or whether it's something deeper entrenched, maybe it's pride, maybe it's lust, Lord, maybe it's envy, covetousness, God, whatever it is that we've been struggling with, I pray, Lord, that we would name it in our own hearts that we would name it and we would ask for you to forgive us of this sin, that we would repent of it, and that you would pour your Holy Spirit fresh into us, wash our feet, Lord, so that as we walk in the light, we might have fellowship with one another, and Jesus recognizing that your blood is what cleansed us and continues to cleanse us from sin. Because you paid for our sin, past, present, and future. And Lord, I don't want future sin. I don't want any part of it. Whatever way you're forging us, whatever way you're purging us, help us to see that your discipline is good and it's for those that you love. That we would strengthen our weak knees and straighten our backs and walk humbly with you. Teach us to love mercy. And Lord, we thank you for your word. Work in us as we worship, Lord.